recently we've been looking at geography now on the channel we haven't really looked at anything history wise for quite a bit so here in the upcoming weeks we're going to be looking at some more history to go along with the tv shows and tiktok and media and stuff because well it's just yeah it's i like learning and really other than learning more of y'all's comedians and comedy and things of that nature we really haven't learned a whole lot on the channel so yeah let's go around we're looking at horatio nelson britain's most beloved sailor let's get into it being an island nation you would figure that great britain would have its fair share of naval heroes after all the wooden walls <coughs> of the royal navy protected the nation from invasion by various unfriendly continental neighbors for hundreds of years and then projected british strength across a globe-spanning empire that the sun never set on but if you asked who the greatest of britain's naval heroes are most people would give you the same answer the humble son of an anglican priest horatio nelson rose to the rank of vice admiral while confounding and taking apart the French and Spanish navies sent against him, becoming one of the most famous men in the world in the process. He did everything he could do to encourage that fame, relishing in his own success, but he was also genuinely beloved by the people who knew him well, and particularly the sailors who served under him. His style of leadership is cited today in business and military leadership courses as being highly effective. Nelson's death only added to his legend, killed with almost the last bullet in the greatest naval battle of the age and one of the most famous in world history. Once again, the Royal Navy had prevailed, frustrating the invasion plans of Napoleon and keeping British soil safe. But the death of Nelson at Trafalgar touched off a wave of national mourning that made people question if it was all worth it. But before we tell you about his death, let us tell you about his fascinating and complicated life. The, the fact that we're sitting here over jeez, my head and numbers right now are not good Ugh. what 150 200 years I'm trying to remember exactly when Horatio Nelson was around let's see Napoleon so it'd be after the French Revolution, so 1800. So, yeah, about 200, over 200 years still. So, yeah, yeah, because it's 2023. And if I'm off by a few years, forgive me. But anyways, the fact that you, historically, for a nation with as long of a history, during the time, during a time when they were at, at the peak, probably, of their power, you've got somebody that's still, number one, is <laughs> revered historically, or beloved historically but also uh still used leadership st is still used an example in, in business and other uh probably leadership courses as well just it says a lot about somebody right it says quite a bit about somebody because uh, most of the time we all just try to take and make our mark within our little sphere that we're in so once we're gone we're remembered for two or three generations at least right This is this is something that right here, this if you're remembered for over two hundred years because of your from more than just your deeds, you've done something worthwhile, I'd say. Horatio Nelson was born on September the 29th, 1758, in Norfolk, England. His father, Edmund, was the parish priest of the small village of Burnham Thorpe. His mother, Catherine's brother, Maurice Suckling, was a captain in the Royal Navy, and young Horatio seemed destined for a naval career from the start. In 1771, aged only 12, Nelson became a midshipman, reporting to the ship HMS Reasonable, captained by his uncle, to be trained as a naval officer. In those days, it was common for teenage boys to serve on Navy ships. In the days before for military academies, it was figured that the best teacher for would-be officers was first-hand experience. His early career was helped along by his uncle, who ensured that he was continually transferred to ships that were to see active service, so that Nelson rapidly gained more experience than his peers and was thus promoted quicker. In yeah, that would definitely be in, even, even now, like, you join a navy and you don't exactly have to serve on a ship, but to progress rank and to take and move up faster, it's more beneficial to serve on a ship. You joined a navy back then, or 
you get trained by being on every ship that goes out to sea or ships that are sent out to sea. You're definitely, especially to be, tr especially being trained as a naval officer, you're gonna have a leg up on the competition, so to speak. So that Nelson rapidly gained more experience than his peers and was thus promoted quicker. In 1777, he was promoted to lieutenant and was assigned to HMS Lowestoff, which was about to sail to Jamaica and to war. <laughs> The rebellion of the Thirteen Colonies of America had quickly blossomed into a worldwide war, with the entry of France and Spain into the conflicts on the side of the Americans. The Caribbean, where ships from all... And that's not to mention also the Prussian... Um, wait, did he just say... Anyways, he had the, the Prussian mercenaries or whatever. Tree of France and Spain into the conflicts on the side of the Americans. The Caribbean, where ships from all four belligerents routinely sailed, was a hotbed of naval activity. Nelson spent the next two years taking prizes, capturing enemy ships, the value of which was awarded to the ship's crew as prize money, all the while being given more and more responsibility as his obvious talents became apparent. He was promoted to captain in 1779, and in early 1780, Nelson captured a Spanish-held fort on the San Juan River in Nicaragua, his first significant military achievement. His career was temporarily stalled when he was struck ill with malaria and was forced to return to Britain to recover. Nelson soon returned to active duty in command of the HMS Albemarle, which he commanded up and down the American coast until the war ended in an American victory in 1783. After the war, Nelson was sent to the Caribbean to act as a sort of policeman, seizing any American ships that attempted to trade with British colonial islands, which was illegal under the Navigation Acts. It was during this time that he met Francis Fanny Nez a widow who lived on a plantation on the island of Nevis. Nelson was smitten, and her uncle offered him a large dowry to marry her. It wasn't until after they were engaged that Nelson discovered the dowry was a fiction. The family wasn't worth anywhere near as much as they had claimed. To make matters worse, Fanny had hidden the fact that she was infertile, incapable of having children, until after they were engaged. Break Ooh. Ooh, that's... Wow, back then, something like that. Especially... Especially lying about your fertility back then. Oh, wow. But thou not being worth anything. That's. Hoo hoo. Well, they was trying to take and be on the up and on the come up, right? wasn't they? Great God. But that's that's something, if I'm not mistaken, it, it, like, wasn't there laws against stuff like that? Like, you couldn't. Because, especially if you're, if you're marrying and you have all this stuff being attached to someone, like. You could get in trouble for certain, for stuff back back in the day, if I'm not mistaken. Fact that she was infertile, incapable of having children until after they were engaged. Breaking off the engagement would have been dishonorable for an English gentleman, so Nelson had no choice but to go ahead with the wedding in 1787. The deception had soured the romance, however, and Nelson and Fanny would become more and more estranged as time passed. In 1788, Nelson was sent home to Britain, and for five years he languished on shore without a command. With no war to fight, there simply weren't enough ships to go round in the peacetime navy, and so Nelson was kept in reserve on half pay and had absolutely nothing to do but tend to his affairs at home while continually badgering anyone he knew for a command. He got his chance in late 1792 when the French revolutionary government, eager to flex its might to its neighbors, annexed the Austrian Netherlands, modern day Belgium, which had traditionally been kept as a buffer state. The move heightened tensions between Britain and France, and in preparation for war, the Royal Navy called back its reserve officers, including Nelson, in January 1793. Soon after, France declared war, and Nelson's ship sailed to Gibraltar in May as part of a fleet determined to establish British naval supremacy in the Mediterranean. The flashpoint of the area was the French city of Toulon, which was held by French royalists but came under attack by the revolutionary Jacobins. The city appealed to the Royal Navy for help, but eventually a large Republican force occupied the hills around the city and began to bombard it into submission. The artillery officer in charge of the bombardment was a young man named Napoleon Bonaparte, and this was to be the start of his own military success story, though no one knew it at the time. 
Toulon fell in December, and seeking a naval base close to the French coast, the fleet commander ordered Nelson to blockade the French-controlled island of Corsica, followed by an invasion in February 1794. After the army proved reluctant to proceed, Nelson himself was put in command of the land forces and helped capture the city of Bastia. He played an important It's not something you see happen these days as far as military is concerned. You're not going to have a naval officer actually commanding the ground troops. It's There's a you controlled your naval you, you you control the sailors we'll have somebody come in and control the that's just not something that's one of the things that i think that 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 being able to kind of do both i, I think is something that uh, at least in, it, from what i know at least of our military here that just doesn't happen now it might happen in other places in the world but I think for the most part, everybody has an army, they've got a navy, and the two are kind of, they work together, but are separate. Like, you don't see much of that kind of stuff anymore. ...enrolling ground operations for the remainder of the Corsican campaign using cannons offloaded from naval ships to bombard enemy positions. On July the 12th, Nelson was wounded by debris from an artillery round that exploded near one of his batteries. The wound eventually cost him his sight in his right eye. <clears throat> After the capture of Corsica, Nelson spent the next three years engaged in operations in the Mediterranean until French victories in Italy at the head of an army commanded by Napoleon forced the Royal Navy to leave their base in Corsica and sail to Gibraltar in December 1796. Nelson was on the way to join them on February 1, 1797, when, quite by accident, he happened upon the Spanish fleet that had left Cartagena and was headed south to the port of Cadiz to eventually link up with their French allies. Nelson's ship, unseen in the fog, escaped to alert the fleet commander, Admiral John Jervis, of the Spanish movements. Jervis decided to give battle, and on Valentine's Day, the two fleets met off of Cape St. Vincent. It was here that Nelson first distinguished himself in the eyes of the British public. In command of the HMS Captain, he engaged three much larger Spanish ships and captured two of them by boarding them and engaging in vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's... Jesus Christ. Christ. No, yeah, that would be that would that's something that, as far as the public is is concerned, that's going to capture their imagination. Because I know at before the British uh, Navy was such a uh, badass entity, uh, the Spanish Armada, you know, the Spanish naval, the Spanish naval fleet were were the big bad uh, bullies on the block, and. Um, after, well, after Mother Nature and some, <laughs> and some uh, bad, bad warring and things like that, like they still had a very good navy, but the fact that he had he captured two larger two larger ships, two, that just that's. That's insane, to be honest with you. That's absolutely crazy. That would I can see the reason why that would capture the the the, the popularity of a populace because that's just that's it's tough enough to take and capture one, but you capture like yeah, yeah. That's that's some daring do in battle right there ships and captured two of them by boarding them and engaging in vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat. The prize money from these two captured ships made Nelson rich, and his heroism at Cape St. Vincent had made him famous. He was now Sir Horatio Nelson, having been made Knight of the Bath, and soon after the battle, he was promoted to Rear Admiral. One of the first things Admiral Nelson did after his promotion was to oversee a plan to capture the city of Santa Cruz de Tenerife in the Canary Islands, an important Spanish outpost and stopover point for the Spanish treasure fleets returning from the Americas. The plan called for a simultaneous bombardment and an amphibious landing. 
But after two aborted attempts to storm the beach on the night of July 24, 1797, Nelson decided to lead the troops ashore himself. The resulting battle was a disaster for the British. The Spanish defenders were well dug in, and they blasted the invading troops on the beach with cannon fire and musketry. No sooner had Nelson gone ashore than he was shot in the right arm and collapsed back into his boat. The musket ball had smashed his humerus bone into multiple pieces, and he was rowed back to his flagship to be attended to by the surgeon. Medicine at the time period was barely out of the Dark Ages. Germ theory was still decades away, and the most common way to prevent a wounded limb from getting gangrene and killing the victim was to amputate it. Most of Nelson's right arm was sliced off and thrown overboard. Most of the British force didn't fare much better. When they withdrew the next day, 250 had been killed and another 128 wounded. Nelson was dis Jesus, after such a such a successful battle beforehand with the capture of the two ships, that's Wow, talking about being knocked on your ass. Respondent, both over the failure to capture Santa Cruz and by the loss of his arm. He wrote to the commanding admiral of the Mediterranean fleet that he intended to return home to England and retire, as, in his words, a left-handed admiral will never again be considered useful. Nelson remained in England for several months recuperating, but in March 1798 he went to sea again, having been convinced that the Royal Navy had use for a one-armed admiral after all, and that retirement didn't really suit him anyway. He returned to the Mediterranean, where he was given a squadron of 15 ships and ordered to Toulon to intercept a French fleet that was on the move. In France, Napoleon Bonaparte had become the most important political and military figure in the country. His strategy for 1798 was to invade Egypt with a large army and navy, and thus bring pressure to British-occupied India. This was in the hope that it would threaten her commercial interests and force Great Britain to abandon the war. Napoleon got away from Nelson after the British ships were blown off course by a storm, but the British soon pursued them across the Mediterranean to Alexandria. The French. What is it with people that go after <laughs> after the British and storms blowing them off course? Like that seems to be a running theme. <laughs> Jesus army had already won a series of victories against the ruling Mamluks, and the French fleet was anchored off the coast of Alexandria in a delta of the Nile River in a supposedly impregnable defensive position. But Nelson was unimpressed and moved immediately to attack. As dusk fell on August the 1st, the British ships fell upon the stationary French ships. The French Admiral de Broglie had figured that the shoals on the flanks of his battle line would prevent the British from getting onto his starboard right side and thus surrounding him, so all of his sailors were ordered to man the port left side cannons. But Nelson's lead ships found a gap in the shoals, and suddenly the French found themselves under attack from both sides. Darkness fell, oh but the goodness. scene was illuminated by the battle raging in the Nile Delta. Cannons belched out flames from all sides and started several fires, including one that engulfed the French flagship Lorient. This exploded when the flames reached the gunpowder magazine, killing Admiral de Bray's. Admiral Nelson was wounded for the third time in his career, a flesh wound that he quickly had bandaged, and then he returned to oversee the battle. Overwhelmed by the amount of British cannons brought to- I'm sure at that point being wounded was an old hat for him. I mean, he'd already lost sight in his eye and now his right arm, so had bandaged and then he returned to oversee the battle. Overwhelmed by the amount of British cannons brought to bear on them, the French ships began to surrender as dawn broke on August the 2nd. The battle was, for all intents and purposes, over. The French fleet was completely destroyed. Out of 17 ships that began the battle, four were burned and nine were captured. The French suffered 3,500 casualties to the British 900. The battle had great strategic consequences for the war. It trapped Napoleon's army in Egypt, forcing the general to return to France without his troops. He never trusted the navy again, and this mistrust would weigh heavily in his future military decisions. Great Britain, meanwhile, had gained complete dominance of the seas around the conflict zone, an advantage they'd hold for the rest of the war. Nelson's victory at the Battle of the Nile made him a national hero. Heads of state from all over Europe sent him accolades, and he reveled in the attention. For all his many virtues, Nelson was rather vain and a shameless self-promoter. For instance, when, shortly after word reached London of his victory, he was given the title Baron Nelson of the Nile, and Nelson was insulted that he was only given a mere baronry instead of a more <laughs> prestigious title. Shortly after the Battle of the Nile... My ego is a motherfucker. God dang.
than a mere baronry instead of a more prestigious title. Shortly after the Battle of the Nile, Nelson sailed to Naples to refit his squadron. He was feted by the Neapolitan royal court and was a guest of British ambassador Sir William Hamilton. Nelson had briefly met Sir William and his wife Emma in 1793, but he was a far different man now. He was scarred, he was blind in one eye, missing an arm, and internationally renowned. Emma Hamilton was 35 years younger than her husband and was considered one of the most beautiful and intelligent women of her day. During Nelson's stay in Naples, he and Emma fell deeply in love with each other and soon were carrying on an affair that the entire world seemed to know about. The strange part was that not only was it apparent that Sir William was aware of his wife's affair with Nelson, but he was surprisingly open-minded about it considering the time he lived in. The well, at that point, but you also got to think, men of power back then also, I mean, there, how many, how many things <laughs> as far as stuff like this happening throughout history, it, it, the whole world knew about it, even though one person or the other was married or both. Like it's not, for me, that's not a surprising type of thing to hear because that it's not like it was so very common, but it's not like it was so rare that it's like, hmm, interesting. No, 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 no. It's, this kind of crap happened. I mean, the three lived together in Naples, and when Hamilton was recalled home to England, Nelson returned as well, and the three set up together at a house in London, much to the fury of Nelson's wife, Fanny. That's... Okay, that part right there, them three shacking up together. Not so much you didn't hear about. It, it was definitely normally a, an affair, and everybody knew about it. And sometimes the husband would know about it, but he's not. He didn't say anything because he had like three other affairs going on too. Like this, <laughs> it's kind of different than a the sister wife show that you see on TLC. This is more be like uh, brother husbands. And the three set up together at a house in London, much to the fury of Nelson's wife, Fanny. Around Christmas 1800, Fanny gave her husband an ultimatum to choose Emma or her. And, well, Nelson chose his mistress. The two never lived together again. On January the 1st, 1801, Nelson was promoted to Vice Admiral and was sent on a new assignment to the Baltic Sea. Denmark, tired of Britain blockading her ports to stop French trade, had allied itself with Prussia, Sweden, and Russia in order to break the blockade of the Royal Navy. Nelson was sent as part of a fleet to break up this league of armed neutrality that threatened British naval supremacy in Europe. Nelson convinced his superior, Admiral Parker, to allow him to take a dozen ships of the line into Copenhagen Harbor and attack the Danish fleet before they had time to join up with the Swedish and Russian fleets. Nelson attacked on April the 2nd. The battle didn't start out well for the British. Three ships ran aground early in the battle, prompting Admiral Parker to signal the retreat. But Nelson, who had a better grasp of the situation than Parker did, decided to continue the the attack. In a bit of his trademark wit, he held up his telescope to his blind eye and said, I honestly can't see the signal. The battle soon <laughs> turned in the favor of the British as they destroyed three Danish ships and captured and burned a dozen more. Yeah, Nelson called for a truce, which the Danes accepted. The destruction of the Danish fleet, together with the sudden death of Tsar Peter I of Russia, marked the end of the League, and Nelson returned home to receive more accolades. He was now Viscount Nelson of the Nile and considered the country's foremost naval hero. In October 1801, Great Britain and France signaled the Peace of Amiens, ending the war. Nelson spent the next two years in Britain, living with William and Emma Hamilton, and touring the country with them. Emma had given birth to a daughter, Horatia, that everyone knew was Nelson's illegitimate daughter, and the unconventional family all lived together at a country estate in Surrey until Sir William died in April 1803. A month later, war again broke out, and Nelson was back at sea. Had an illegitimate daughter, the wife's husband dies. So did they get married at some point? On their mind, Trafalgar, okay. Later, war again broke out and Nelson was back at sea. Nelson was appointed commander of the Mediterranean fleet and given the pride of the Royal Navy, HMS Victory, as his flagship. His orders were to blockade Toulon, where the French Navy, under the command of Admiral Pierre Charles Villeneuve, was at anchor. It was essential to keep the French ships from escaping the blockade and moving north to the English Channel, where they could help Napoleon, now Emperor of the French, invade Great Britain. For two years, Nelson. 
I've always thought it funny with the with especially with France. You had the you know the revolution there and they overthrew the monarchs and stuff like that. But then the popularity of you know Napoleon Bonaparte and his you know and, and everything, and then he comes to power and he's emperor. Like so, you trade off one one oligarchy for for a tyrant. Okay, I'm like you, you trade one set of tyrants for another. Like yeah. Uh. Nelson and Villeneuve played a cat and mouse game with each other, a series of back and forth maneuvers that saw Nelson at one point chase Villeneuve all the way across the Atlantic to the West Indies and then back again. In August 1805, Nelson returned briefly to England on leave. He was cheered everywhere he went, much to his delight. In September, word came the Allied French and Spanish fleets had combined together at the Spanish port of Cadiz. Nelson knew it was time to return to sea. He departed on board Victory on September the 14th after saying That's goodbye to his ass. beloved Emma. Nelson arrived at Cadiz on September the 27th and spent most of the next month preparing for the battle he was sure was to come. Meanwhile, his French counterpart Villeneuve was feeling the heat from Napoleon. The Emperor was angry that his admiral wouldn't engage the British fleet and break out of the blockade at Cadiz. He sent a replacement overland to Cadiz to take command of the fleet. Villeneuve, in an effort to stave off the humiliation of being relieved of command, decided to sail out before his replacement arrived. On October the 20th, the 33 ships of the Franco-Spanish fleet sailed out of Cadiz and were spotted by British scout frigates who quickly moved to inform Nelson. On October the 21st, Nelson moved his 27 ships to engage the enemy off the coast of Cape Trafalgar. At 11.45, he prepared to engage. He ordered a signalman to signal the rest of the ships in the fleet. England expects that every man will do his duty. A great cheer went up throughout the British fleet. Nelson was truly beloved by the many commanders. In a time when naval officers were expected to be strict disciplinarians to the point of cruelty towards the common sailor, Nelson garnered respect with affection and kindness. Nelson's battle plan was simple. He meant to close with the Franco-Spanish fleet as quickly as possible, cut their battle line into three pieces, and engage the enemy in ship-to-ship -ship combat, which he was sure he would be victorious at due to the superior training of his gunnery crews. He split his force into two squadrons, one led by himself aboard Victory, and the other led by his second-in-command, Admiral Collingwood, aboard the Royal Sovereign. With a little wind to speed their progress, the British ships slowly moved towards the Allied line, all while under fire from the French and Spanish ships. Finally, after almost an hour, victory passed between two French ships and fired a devastating broadside. Other ships followed, and a general... Just looking at the picture here with all of those open... I don't know if y'all can see this right here. No, can't see. Dang on. But all of these... <laughs> like, just the cannons sticking out the side. A devastating blow. If all those cannons fired at once and hit something, yes, that would be a definitely a devastating blow because you've got two stat rows of cannons. Yeah, yeah, it's going to do some damage. Melee ensued. Victory found herself engaging the French ship Redoubtable. The French crew had largely abandoned their cannons and were massing on deck to try and board the Admiral's flagship until they were cut apart by the cannon fire of a passing British ship. All the while, a murderous fire poured down from the Redoubtable's mast and rigging from sailors stationed up there with muskets. Nelson had forbidden his captains from doing this, worried about the sails catching on fire. Thus, unhampered, the French sharpshooters could pick their targets at will, and Nelson, standing on the quarter deck in his distinct of uniform made for a perfect target. At around 1 p.m., an hour into the battle, Nelson was shot, the bullet entering through his shoulder blade and severing his spinal cord. The admiral collapsed to the deck, recognizing immediately that the wound was fatal. He was carried below deck and made comfortable, as there was nothing that the doctor could do for him. Nelson lived long enough to hear that yet another spectacular victory was his. The French and Spanish had lost 22 ships, the British had lost none. Thank God I have done my duty. Jesus Christ lost 22 ships British lost. that's in his plan of cutting them up into three lines like just that's that's an understanding and knowledge of tactics especially on the sea and how to take and get things accomplished with the ships that you have at hand like that's it's incredible Nelson said the admiral died at 4:30 at the age of 47 
There was no celebration of the victory at the Battle of Trafalgar. Instead, the death of Admiral Nelson touched off a period of profound national mourning in Great Britain that wouldn't be seen again until the death of Princess Diana nearly 200 years later. Nelson's body was returned to England and given a state funeral at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Thousands of people lined the funeral route and packed the pews of the cathedral to say goodbye to their hero. One person not in attendance, however, was Emma Hamilton. Nelson had neglected to amend his will to include Emma and Horatia, and although he begged the country to take care of them before he died, Nelson's brother, who inherited most of his estate, was completely uninterested in helping her. The British public may have been willing to overlook Nelson's affair because of his status as a national hero, but after his death, Emma was branded an adulterer and was shunned by her former friends. Of course, because he's no longer around, and why should they care? Like, that's just how society worked back then. She died in 1815 at the age of 49, deeply in debt and suffering from a number of health problems. Her daughter with Nelson, Horatia, lived a quiet life as a reverend's wife and raised ten children, living until 1881. Nelson had so many places and things named after him that it would be impossible to list them all. The most famous of these is Trafalgar Square in London, one of the most popular tourist attractions in the city. Located prominently in the square is a 145-foot, 44-meter granite column topped with a statue of the man who will likely forever be known as Britain's most beloved sailor. That was that was interesting. See, I, it's I might have to start buying some more books to take and tell tell stories from like historical stories of what's happened because this is stuff that i've i learned about like in the napoleonic wars and um i i learned about that that english is in the england's war with france you know under napoleon bonaparte and just you hear you 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 don't we didn't really get in depth with some of the the, the british some of the you heard you read about battles, but you didn't read about the people behind the battles a lot. Um, that's one of the things I did in, whenever I was in high school. Like I, I read about Ulysses Grant. I read about Washington, Jefferson, um, Franklin. I took and read about Jeb Stuart. I took and read about um, to come. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know why I thought I was thinking of Tecumseh, but uh, William Tecumseh Sherman. But Sherman I read about Sherman and. In his march through the South, like I read about a lot of people, I, I read about like uh, Sergeant York and um, Patton and Douglas MacArthur and uh, like I've I've read about so many people. I, I've read multiple biographies on uh, Lincoln. Um, just I used to read voraciously historical stuff after I got older, and um, I don't know started seeing. I guessed it within government I didn't want to read no more historical stuff because it's either I was like there's either so much stuff now left out or um, stuff just wasn't as it was presented uh, sometimes at least in how we're taught in school and that's one of the things that I kind of got I was just like man you know they teach this and I'm reading this and the, and the biographies and, and the different books on the history of certain things and it's just like it's presented this way but the reality of it's complete you know it, it there's a lot more nuance <laughs> And there's, it's not quite the way they presented it. So it just, I don't know. I stopped reading so much about history and started reading more about, uh, reading more fantasy stuff. And I'm definitely, definitely now I've gotten older, especially as I've started doing this channel. It's been a minute. We've looked at some historical stuff from like World War II and everything. Now we're going to, you know, and we've looked at like the history of, some countries and like 10 minute blurbs 10 minute blurbs excuse me but it, it's going forward we're going to take a look at more history for sure like that's something that I've, I've neglected for a while on the channel but we are going to take more of a look at this was fascinating absolutely fascinating and, and the fact <laughs> the baron he wanted something higher than a baron <laughs> ego ego but then again i mean he'd done quite a bit you know it's a fascinating character and the fact that he's still as a gentleman because even as a gentleman he didn't have to actually marry her i mean he's it's 
one of those things is like, yeah, I've agreed to the engagement, but it was under false pretenses. And he didn't have to take and be a gentleman. He could have took and just quietly been like, no, we've broken off the engagement. He didn't have to take and actually say over why or anything of that nature and could have pursued other women. And he didn't until, of course, uh, Emma Hamilton. In which, like I said, having affairs back then and men of great stature, what exactly, that's it's not like it was, it didn't happen. And the whole world knowing about it, again, it's not like stuff like that didn't happen. But the three of them moving in together. That's definitely different. That's definitely just a wee bit different. Just a smidge. Um, normally that's, yeah, you, you, you didn't. Normally it was just a well-known thing and people looked the other direction because they, they were either well-loved or they had that much power. Like, that's just how it kind of worked. Um, so that fact and then the wife taking and giving the ultimatum and then having the illegitimate daughter and not taking a change of the will to include Emma and the daughter. But again, you know, that's just how things worked back then. And might be beloved by people, but they're definitely, oh yeah, it's not our problem. Not our problem. But uh, definitely a brilliant, it sounds like leader because he was right. Back in the day, the, especially the, the naval, naval officers could be unnecessarily cruel at times. Um, and it was all for the purposes of not so much morale as much as just discipline and maintaining order on ships. So the fact that he didn't use tactics like that, or at least, you know, from the impression we're given he wasn't he didn't use tactics like that and was well beloved and still well respected means he's doing a whole lot of whole lot of stuff right as far as leadership is concerned so i uh i definitely enjoyed this hope y'all did y'all y'all be good to each other love yourselves peace